Hi, I'm Micah Halpern. Thank you for joining me today as I do some thinking out loud. Our first segment is called Background Briefing. The first thing I've been thinking about is an innocent event during which I was subjected to anti-Semitic rants from people calling out of their windows in the middle of the Upper West Side of Manhattan. It was surreal, but it was also very real. It was late Saturday morning, about 11.45, a Shabbat morning, the tiny shtibel, the small prayer room in which I pray, had just finished Shabbat morning services. On a regular Shabbat, a normal Shabbat, a grand kiddush would follow. Wonderful appetizers would burst from the kitchen, at least five different styles of herring accompanied by crackers and kichel, the sweet egg noodle cookies, uh, made specifically uh, to, uh, to cup the herring, any number of single malt scotches, a few blended, several top shelf bourbons would be paraded out to us for tasting, to recite the Kiddush, a bracha. That would only be the beginning. Some weeks there would be a uh, uh, charcuterie with scrumptious mustards and other things. There were always at least two kugels, more often four, an oily potato kugel for those who believe that kugel must cry, a less oily potato kugel for those non-believers, a sweet noodle kugel, and my favorite, the salt and pepper kugel, and a Yerushalmi kugel, a Jerusalem kugel. That's my favorite, not because of taste, although I do enjoy a good piece of Yerushalmi, but for what it represents. Yerushalmi kugel, Jerusalem kugel, is a blend of cultures. It's East meets West, Sephardi meets Ashkenazi, sizzling brown from the burnt sugar and tea mixed with egg noodles to satisfy Ashkenazi taste, spiced with black pepper to satisfy the Sephardi taste. But that was nothing normal about this Shabbat. It was another long line of altered COVID Shabbatot. The shtibel is located in a small brownstone. It's smaller than most private swimming pools, smaller than most combined living rooms and dining rooms in suburban homes. We were 28 people, all men, socially distanced and masked. As prayers ended, one man began handing out miniature airline-style bottles of vodka and individually wrapped cinnamon danish. Then came a single portion of chillant, individually wrapped. Not quite grand, but still a Kiddush, a Kiddush COVID style, a variation on the theme of Kiddush. Kiddush, but not really Kiddush. No one wants to say this out loud, but people really go to synagogue for the Kiddush. Believe me, they don't come to hear the rabbi's sermon. And I think, of, when you think about it, more people are in synagogue for the conclusion of the services and for the Kiddush that follows than are there for the prayers that come before. There was nothing normal about this Shabbos because as our prayers ended and as we were about to enjoy our COVID Kiddush, the next president of the United States was named. Because the shtibel is located on the ground floor of a brownstone, it comes with its own backyard, a luxurious rarity in Manhattan. Until the pandemic, that yard was only used once a year on Sukkot, when the sukkah took up most of the entire outside. Now that, it's used, now that it's used every Shabbos for a COVID Kiddush. There were eight of us sitting outside when our Shabbat reverie was shattered by sounds of celebration, drums, cheering. Someone actually heard a shofar being blown. Happy sounds. It was coming from apartment buildings and surrounding neighborhoods, all kinds of things, all around the Shtibel's backyard. Everyone looked at me, the resident news bearer. I surmised that the networks had concluded that the state of Pennsylvania had flipped the Biden securing the former vice president's place as the 46th president of the United States. This was an orthodox shtibel in New York, and almost every orthodox Jewish person voted for Donald Trump. Although I didn't ask, I would never ask, and no one asked me, which is good too, I am pretty sure that no one in that room was an exception to that rule. In fact, several of the worshipers are actually to the right of Attila the Hun. And then the cheering stopped, as if in concert, the Shtibel's neighbors, those who could look down on the backyard, began opening their windows, and the shouting began. Anti-Semitic slurs were hurled at us, one after the other after the other. Awful comments, comments that I will not repeat. Most of us remained silent. Two men who felt the need to respond shouted back, thanks for being so tolerant. 
One of our verbal attackers, I guess, had run out of anti-Semitic slurs, shouted, and you're not even vegetarians. True, but how relevant that is, I don't know. On the Upper West Side of Manhattan, the bastion of liberalism, we were being peppered with anti-Semitic slurs. We could see their faces. We know who they are. We shop in the same supermarkets. We go to the same drugstores and dry cleaners. They had no shame. All they had was vitriol and anger. This was not an Antifa group in Portland. They didn't have their heads covered. It was not a group of college kids or young people. These were serious adults shouting from the comfort of their homes. They were shouting at me, and by extension, at all Jews. They were not just celebrating the Biden victory. They were celebrating that when it came to politics, we, keep powering Jews, were now on the short end of the spectrum. COVID has changed our lives. So too is politics. COVID is not in our control. Politics is, at least in the democratic society, it should be. Next up, a thing that I've been thinking about is actually the Saudis and whether they'll be joining the other nations that have been normalizing relations with Israel. I've spoken a lot about normalization. I've mentioned this before. Saudi Arabia is not going to be next in line in the Middle East countries to normalize relations with Israel. Saudi Arabia is in line, though, but certainly not in the front of the line. There are many reasons, and one is that the United States has been pressuring Saudi Arabia to normalize their relationships, and, their, um, and they are a massive power in the region. Saudi power is based on their wealth, on the ways in which they spread their influence. They also are contributors and sponsors to many things. Even more significant, they are the guardians of the Islamic holy sites in Mecca and Medina. Saudis have pull, they have sway. As open as they are to the West, and it may appear that way, there is a significant group of leaders in Saudi Arabia, especially Wahhabi religious leaders, that is extremely conservative, and they would have great difficulty normalizing standards and relations with the Jewish state, especially when it came to public celebrations of the normalization. Saudi kingdom functions by maintaining a balance between Wahhabi religious leadership and the royal family. The Wahhabis are fiercely, fervently religious subgroup of Sunni Islam. They are the progenitors of Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden. It is they who are responsible for religious life and education in Saudi Arabia. Normalization would wreck that balance. The elephant in the room is the Saudi human rights record and their attitude towards women. It is a radical departure from acceptable and approved Western thought and behavior, especially in the United States. And it is out of necessity overlooked and skimmed over in dealings with the Saudi kingdom. It is part of the big package. And in these areas, the Saudis are not about to change, not for anyone or anything. Abuses inherent in Saudi human rights and women's rights issues are not a series of exceptions. They are the norm, predicated on fundamental differences between the approach of Western thinking and their thinking. This is an essential point to understand. The Saudis are not similar to some of the banana republics in South America. They have long-standing sets of traditions. They are not simply thrown out because of advantages of a trade deal. We should, and we should disagree on their points. We should do that. We must also recognize that it is not easy to re-educate them. The Saudis do engage with the West. They're incognizant of this chasm and choose consciously to choose to check their Saudi beliefs and ideas, hopefully their behaviors while visiting, learning, and living in the West but they do not wish to alter their Saudi attitudes at home. They have little interest in change, little motivation to update their thinking. Just take, for example, the issue of women driving in Saudi Arabia. In 2018, Prince Salman liberalized the driving law, permitting women to drive. It's been two years, and women are slowly beginning to take driving lessons and get driver's licenses. The prince might have changed the law in the land, but husbands remain the law at home. In October, women were permitted to play golf for the first time. In November, there will be a women's golf tournament competing for $500,000 prize for women all over the world. These are baby steps, but we can't get away from the idea of what's happening here. It is an entirely different world. The perfect example of this is the inside-outside, upside-down relationship that the West has with Saudi Arabia. The Saudi Kingdom has within itself become the head of the G20 summit. It's a rotating chair. The 15th summit is going to be taking place in Riyadh this month. The G20 is composed of 20 countries, the largest economies in the world, and Saudi Arabia assumed the presidency last year. The business side of the G20 is called the B20, Business 20. And the theme of the B20 summit this year in Riyadh 
is women in business. 33% of the delegates are going to be women. This is the highest percentage ever, and it's hard to get this. But the irony is there, because this is a place that hosts the summit, is actually has arrested women for fighting for human and women's rights. It's an unbelievable concept. Under the Saudi Prophet Salman, Saudi Arabia has begun a process of liberalization. It's called Vision 2030. While the real purpose is to become less dependent on oil, the other element is actually the idea of liberalizing the attitude towards women, so that women can drive as a part of the plan. But the Wali is the male guardian of the Wahhabism, and that's still in place, the Wali. Wahhabi dictates, says that the Wali must be in charge. In Arabic, Wali means protector or helper. The religious system even provides mobile apps for men to use in order to protect and watch their women wherever they are. While there are still those who are pushing for Saudi Arabia to normalize with Israel, who think that they would be the perfect partners, that is simply incorrect at this stage. It is now clear how fast, if at all, Saudi is going to be a part of this liberalization and normalization. In fact, what is clear at this stage is that normalization and in liberalization is not in Israel's interest. And it's not in the United States' interest to push it or rush it now either. Coming up next, point of view. First up is a column from Al Jazeera, dated November 8th, 2020. It's written by Lina Al Safan. Al Safan is an American online producer for Al Jazeera, the whole network. It's important to read and get an understanding of what's happening around you and how other groups like Al Jazeera are looking at things. Looking at the column from Al Jazeera helps broaden and deepen our understanding. This column is addressed to the Arab world and its objective is to evaluate a Biden presidency and predict the attitude towards Israel and the Palestinians. al Safan does an excellent job showing historical examples and arguing her case. The column is entitled, Joe Biden, No Savior of the Palestinians. Subtitled, Palestinians Eye Restoration of U.S. Relations, but Skepticism Abounds that Biden's election will win marks a strategic American policy change. This is how she begins. In October 1973, newly elected Delaware Senator Joe Biden visited Israel on his first official overseas trip and met with Israeli Prime Minister Golda Meir. The 30-year-old was visibly moved as Meir explained what she said was Israel's militarily dangerous situation surrounded by enemy states. But he cheered up when the Israeli leader revealed what she said was Israel's secret weapon. Israelis have nowhere else to go. Biden has retold the story countless times, describing the event as one of the most consequential meetings I've ever had in my life. It marked the beginning of his unwavering support for Israel and close ties with many Israeli leaders since then. Now Al Safan shows how the Arabic press is covering the U.S. presidential election, and she shows Palestinian leaders and their attitudes. She continues by writing that several Palestinian news agencies carried the statements of Palestinian officials with their perspectives on what President-elect Biden's victory would mean for them. In her, her words, Nabil Shah, the special representative of President Mahmoud Abbas, said that the Palestinian leadership does not expect a strategic change in U.S. policy towards the Palestinians, but getting rid of the era of Trump, which he described as the worst, is an advantage. From what we heard from Joe Biden and his deputy Kamala Harris, I think he will be more balanced and less submissive to Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, thus less harmful to us than Trump, he said. Hanan Ashrari, a member of the Palestinian Liberation Organization's PLO Executive Committee, said, while the first step is to get rid of Trump and the danger he poses, she stressed Biden will not be a savior for the Palestinians. Restoration of the Palestinian Authority's relations with the U.S. after Biden's victory is under discussion and evaluation, she said. Matters do not happen automatically, she added. Rather, the list of demands, interests, and positions must be determined, and there is a need for a change in many issues. Ashrari said, decades of pro-Israel U.S. policy produced the Trump policies. What is required is to change what Trump has done by radically changing the racism and politics he represented and building a relationship based on a new vision Justice, respect, and clarity, she said. Al-Safan now explains some 
are more of the quotes that Biden, who proclaims himself to be a staunch Zionist and the lover of Israel, she asserts that not much will change with U.S. administration. And she argues that normalization is off and running, and normalization, as with the other Arab countries, will continue under Biden as well. This is how she concludes. Regarding the normalization of relations between Israel and the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Sudan, Biden has previously tried to claim credit for sowing the original seeds under Obama's terms in office. Biden has urged Arab states to move beyond quiet talks and take bolder steps towards normalization with Israel. A well-written and even-handed thoughtful piece. Next up, an editorial from the Baltimore Jewish Times. It's extremely critical of British Labour Party and especially Jeremy Corbyn. It's entitled, Corbyn is gone, but Labour anti-Semitism remains. And it was published on November 5th, 2020. Labour was the political home to the Jews of the United Kingdom for decades, but the anti-Semitism within the party has gotten so bad there has been a shift. Here is how the editorial begins. Jeremy Corbyn, who led Britain's opposition Labour Party until earlier this year, was suspended from the party last week. He was a leader with a blind spot for his own dislike for Jews and the anti-Semitism he helped foster in his party. The suspension was another sign that the Labour Party is trying to move beyond the strange interlude in which it shunned the country's moderate central-left voters and embraced heavy-handed nationalization, old-fashioned British anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, and friendship with Hamas, whose ideology calls for Israel's destruction. Corbyn was suspended because he dismissed a report on anti-Semitism in his party as dramatically overstated, a reaction that reinforces the observations of Corbyn's critics that he has a blind spot when it comes to anti-Semitism. Now, the editorial explains that Corbyn was not the only anti-Semite. He was a magnet, though, for other anti-Semites and for others who then gave voice to their opinions loudly and clearly within the Labour Party. The editorial continues, Unfortunately, Corbyn wasn't the only Labour right to embrace anti-Semitism. Indeed, according to a British Parliamentary Committee inquiry in 2016, the party became a safe space for those with vile attitudes towards Jewish people. But according to columnist Jonathan Friedland in The Guardian, much of the blame lies with Corbyn, since, I'm quoting here, it's Corbyn as the party leader who made British feel an anxiety they had not known for the best part of the century. It was he who acted as a magnet in drawing assorted cranks and bigots to join the party whose great name they soiled by their very essence. The editorial comes to a conclusion that labor must do more in order to rid itself of anti-Semitism. Here's the conclusion. Labor Party has a lot more to work to do to revitalize itself and to address the continuing festering anti-Semitism in its ranks. How it responds will determine Labour's status as a mainstream party and largely two-party democracy and whether Britain's Jewish community can learn to trust the party that had been its home for decades. Another interesting perspective that broadens our horizons and very, very important to understand. Coming up, commentary through cartoons where pictures tell the story. I want to show you five cartoons today or images. First up is a play on the famous phrase of Descartes, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. Here Descartes is saying, Covito ergo zoom. Because of COVID, I'm zooming. Very funny. <laughs> Next up is a very funny ad on a huge billboard announcing that this year thousands of men will die from stubbornness. Someone, almost certainly a man, added underneath it, no, we won't. This is perfect commentary on our society. The next three cartoons have to do with election humor. And uh, to share my point of view of voting, I'm not going to give you who I voted for because that's not appropriate. But the election process is, of course, something about counting. And the counting of the votes has been very funny. So the first cartoon brings us to Count from Sesame Street. The caption reads, breaking news, counting expert called in. It does not get <laughs> more poignant than that. The children's master teacher of counting coming to certify the count. Next up is a map of the United States marked with electoral delegates. For each state, a child has scribbled blue and red and some yellow all over the map. The caption reads, here's what we know so far. And finally, this last piece makes fun of stress eating and the magic number 270, the number of delegates needed to be elected. 
The caption reads, with all this stress eating, I'll be at 270 before either candidate will be. That's funny. In a moment, my own perspective and a few predictions. Sama is a 900 foot long Iranian oil tanker. A tanker entered the Mediterranean Sea by crossing through the Suez Canal. It was heavy laden with oil coming from Iran. After passing through the Suez Canal and striving to make its way to the Mediterranean Sea, Sama was t- turned off its transponder, its GPS. For all intents and purposes, the location of the tanker became a mystery. Satellite photos, however, show that the Sama was met and escorted by two Russian Navy ships. One of the ships was a destroyer. The ship made its way to Syria. Iran has a long history of delivering oil to Syria, despite the international embargo on Syria and on Iranian oil exports. In this case, Russia is not turning a blind eye. Russia is actually aiding Iran's delivery of badly needed fuel to Syria. Russia has an entire naval base, as well as two full air force bases in Tardis, Syria, in order to help this. They also have a squadron of submarines there. Russia is putting the world on alert, announcing that they will protect Iranian oil tankers. Protect them from whom? From countries thinking of enforcing the embargo. This is a move of intimidation. Israel is investing 100 million in bioconvergence. I don't know if you've heard of it. That's a big investment, and I bet that most people have no idea what it is. Bioconvergence is the overlap of biology, physics, computer science, mathematics, engineering, materials science, and nanotechnology. BC is a new form of biotech. It's the marriage of all forms of science, engineering, and math and medicine, all in order to create this knowledge to create energies to find solutions to difficult issues that until now were not even close to being solved. Utilizing collective wisdom from multiple disciplines is bioconvergence. It is the wave of the future for inventions, and it is the future for investments. Israel's on the cutting edge of this new phenomenon, and Israel's on both sides, on both teams, the development side and on the investment side. Israel learned some very important lessons from tight elections, and they have uh, some important things that they can lend to the United States, and the United States can learn from Israel's experience. Over the last 15 months, let's say, for instance, From December 2018 to March 2020, Israel held three very close elections. Most important lessons learned from these close elections are, first, be patient, and second, do not pay attention to either side's claim of victory. Next, there are always mistakes and problems in counting. These blunders are usually few, and they are the exception. But when they become systematic, that's when it's important to watch. Pay attention only when the mistakes sway the election. The end... Uh, it has to be the true numbers actually do emerge, and the legitimate winners do officially become declared. Do not rush the announcement. Respect the process. For the sake of democracy, it's worth the wait. What will Joe Biden's Middle East policy look like? That's the question that I'm asking, and being asked nonstop everywhere I go, and on the internet. There are certain givens, and there are many question marks, but the givens are worth talking about. The obvious is that Joe Biden has already said over and over again that he's going to return to the JCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, or in lay terms, the Iranian deal. It was no secret that the Saudis favored Trump over Biden, and Iran, the Iran deal, was a direct threat to Sunni hegemony. Expect tensions on that front. Expect the administration to reopen the Palestinian embassy in Washington, D.C. Expect them to restart aid to the Palestinian Authority. Kamala Harris has already made that promise. Expect them to reach out and bring the PA back to the table based on the two-state solution. Do not expect the U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem to return to its former home in Tel Aviv. Expect a conversation about it. Expect the Palestinians will ask. However, there will almost certainly be discussions about withdrawing the recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital. Israel is in for a series of roller coaster rides. Just get ready for it. Biden has a long and very positive history with Israel. And there were several low points during the eight years of the Obama presidency. But in general, or bigadol, as Israelis like to say, Joe Biden is a friend of Israel. We've been thinking out loud about a lot today. Now that you know what I've been thinking, let me know what you're thinking. Email me at micah at jbstv.org. Tweet me at Micah Halpern. Tell me what you think. Before we end, let me leave you with one picante piece of information. 
Did you know the actual translation of kugel in English is pudding? Not pudding like chocolate pudding, but it's more like bread pudding. In England, they have these savory puddings, which are still very, very common. A kugel is mixed with eggs and put into a baking tin and cooked in the oven. And as we mentioned, there are numerous varieties of kugel. Potato kugel is one of the most common. Lukshin kugel is a noodle kugel. That's another. Sometimes it's sweet, sometimes salt and pepper, sometimes it has cottage cheese or farmer's cheese. There is Yerushalmi kugel, Jerusalem kugel. There's also apple kugel, broccoli kugel, spinach kugel, butternut kugel, and just about any other kugel you can think of. Lakshin, or noodle kugel, is one of those spectacular Yiddish words, lakshin and noodles. Spectacular Yiddish word. It brings us back to an era. Once upon a time, lakshin kugel was king. I remember when the sweet kugel had cherries in it because they put fruit cocktail in it. Lakshin kugel was made from the flat egg noodles. It was an era when there were only three kinds of lakshin, three kinds of noodles. Flat egg noodles for kugel, macaroni, a.k.a. elbows, they were called, and most ubiquitous, spaghetti. Those days are gone. Today we live in the world of pasta, not lakshin. Lithuanian speakers of Yiddish, by the way, pronounced it kigel, not kugel. This disputed pronunciation is huge in certain communities. It's the Yiddish version of you say potato and I say potato. Thank you for thinking out loud with me, Micah Halpern. Let's think out loud again next week on JBS. Thank you.